All right, we are going to start on our lecture here. One moment. We're going to start on our lecture here on chapter 35, and it's titled Rest and Sleep. Um, and you can find this on page 1266 in your book. All righty. So sleep versus rest. So what's the difference? So sleep is a cyclically occurring state of decreased motor activity and perception. Okay, it occurs in a cycle. So during sleep, body functions slow and metabolism falls by 20 to 30%. So the body conserves energy in this state. Sleep is characterized by altered consciousness. So a sleeping person is unaware of the environment and responds selectively to external stimuli. So like an alarm clock or a bright light or other meaningful stimuli usually awake a sleeper, but everyday background noises and soft light typically do not. Okay. Um, and then rest. Rest without sleep is inadequate. Okay. You cannot only rest. You have to sleep as well. So at rest, the body is disturbed by all exterior stimuli, whereas in sleep, it is screened from them by altered consciousness, right? So sleep restores the body. Rest alone cannot do this. However, being restful means to have mild or no activity, to relax and be stress-free, or and can lead, lead to feelings of being refreshed. However, it is not sufficient to only have rest without sleep. <coughs> so the benefits of sleep. So sleep increases mental performance, right? It improves learning and adaptation. It gives the individual a chance to mentally repeat and rehearse facts and situations before they are encountered in wakeful life, okay? Some evidence suggests that sleep and dreaming may facilitate the storage of long-term memory, perhaps by assisting the brain in recognizing and storing information. Older adults have an even greater need for sleep to protect against the natural cognitive functional decline that comes with aging, okay? Um, it appears to restore energy, and it also appears to um, reduce stress and anxiety. It uh, improves our ability to cope and concentrate on activities of daily living, okay? More sleep also reduces the body's sensitivity to pain because sleep and rest and illness are interrelated, Okay, so illness and injury increase the need to sleep and at the same time make it difficult to sleep. So in turn, a lack of sleep increases the susceptibility to, in, to illness, right? It can make us sick by not sleeping enough um, because it compromises the immune system. So people who are ill or injured need more sleep than usual to restore their energy levels. However, they often have difficulty resting because of the pain and other symptoms of their of their illness, right? So terms to know, your circadian rhythm. So this is a biorhythm based on the day-night pattern in a 24-hour cycle, okay? So this term comes from the Latin word circa, which means about, and dies, which means day or once a day, okay? So a person's circadian rhythm <clears throat> is regulated by the cluster of cells in the hypothalamus. Okay, that's important for you to know where that's located. It's in the brainstem. The hypothalamus is in the brainstem. It responds to changing levels of light. So the amount of light that is let through your eyes essentially tells your body what time it is. Okay, that's an important positive influence on your sleep and rest cycle. The more light that comes in your eyes, the more wakeful you're going to feel. Circadian rhythm affects our overall level of functioning. So for example, most people have a higher energy level in the daytime and less energy at night. However, some people are more alert and active in the morning and others function at a higher level in the afternoon and evening, okay? So to maximize sleep quality, it's super important that your sleeping hours are aligned with your circadian rhythm. For example, some people work night shifts but their circadian rhythms of their body are happiest when they go to bed by like 10 p.m. and when they get up at five or six, right? Which means when they work night shift and they try to sleep in the daytime, they don't feel good, 
They just feel blah, right? Even though they have their blackout curtains and their quiet room and all that stuff, their body still feels fatigued because they're not sleeping with their circadian rhythm, right? So that's super important. Um, and so your reticular activating system. So what this is, this is nerve cell bodies that are located in the brainstem. The reticular and cortical neurons are called the reticular activating system or the RAS, okay? Neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters associated with excitatory and inhibitory sleep mechanisms include catecholamines, acetylcholine, serotonin, histamine, and prostaglandins, okay? And tryptophan and adenosin promote feelings of sleepiness, okay? Tryptophan, we know that we, that's big in turkey. That's why everybody says you got to take a big nap after you eat your big turkey Thanksgiving dinner. And then adenosin, um, a lot of the qualities in milk um, turn into adenosin and then creates that feeling of sleepiness. So giving that glass of warm milk to your patient who may ask for it is actually a good intervention because it can actually cause them to be sleepy right? So then stages of sleep. There's many, many stages of sleep here and they're all different. So we're going to go over these. It's important for you to know some of these um, as we get into the more detailed parts of them. So um, there's the non-REM sleep, the NREM sleep, okay? This is also called slow wave sleep because it's characterized by the presence of delta waves, okay? NREM is divided into four stages, each deeper than the one that presents it, precedes it. Okay, so the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system becomes progressively more dominant during each stage of the NREM sleep. So during this phase, the muscles relax, the body temperature lowers, the heart rate and respirations and blood pressure decrease, and we're very sleepy. With REM sleep, REM stands for rapid eye movement. This is required for mental or emotional well being. Okay, so it's essential for mental and emotional restoration, and a loss of REM sleep impairs memory and learning. So here's those stages of sleep I was talking about. So you can see this in figure 35-6 on 1270. Um, so you've got wakefulness. <coughs> wakefulness ranges from full alertness to the early stages of drowsiness, okay? So in REM stage one, this is the transition between wakefulness and sleep, okay? You need to know these. So this is slow eye movements. This is very light sleep. So you can be awakened very easily. You're relaxed, but you're aware of your surroundings. You're kind of groggy. You're heavy, got heavy eyelids. You have regular deep breathing. Your eyelids can open and close slowly. It accounts for about 5% of your total sleep. Okay, dreams are not usually remembered in this, this stage of sleep. Then you have NREM2, stage two. So this is light sleep, okay? So you're easily aroused, your temperature, your heart rate, and blood pressure are decreased slightly, and it accounts for about half of your total sleep time. Then you get into your deep sleep. So your NREM3, this is your deep sleep. This is where you're difficult to arouse. You're very hard to get awake, okay? And if you are awakened in this stage, you may be really confused. So parasympathetic nervous system predominates in this stage. Your temperature, pulse, respirations, and blood pressure slow even more. Your skeletal muscles are very relaxed. You may be snoring. Some dreaming may happen, but dreams are less vivid than those that occur once you get to the REM sleep. Okay, so this sleep stage is especially important for the restorative process, such as healing, growth, and tissue renewal. Makes up about 20 to 25% of our sleep time. And then is your REM sleep. So this is highly active sleep with spontaneous awakenings. Okay, so it's less, re less restful than in REM sleep, and your eyes move rapidly and small muscles twitch. It's essential for mental and emotional restoration. Your metabolism, your temperature, your pulse and blood pressure increase in this stage. Apnea may occur. Your gastric secretions increase. You have an increased um, event of dreaming. If awakened, this person will react normally when in, R in REM sleep. Okay. It accounts for about 25% of total sleep. 
Test your knowledge. So light sleep and slowing brain and body processes are associated with which stage of NREM sleep? The correct answer is stage two. These are characteristics of a person with stage two in REM sleep. Let's talk about factors that are gonna affect sleep. So sleep patterns are affected by age. For example, newborns and young children are gonna experience prolonged REM sleep periods. Young adults spend about 25% of their sleep in REM sleep and older adults typically enter REM sleep quicker and spend more time in this active phase of sleep. Our diets also affect how we sleep. So meals located loaded with saturated fats prior to bedtime are going to interfere with your sleep. And foods such as milk, like we talked about, milk and cheese and animal proteins like turkey, like we talked about, can help with sleep by converting the amino acids in the foods into serotonin, right? Um, carbs also help with sleep by increasing brain serotonin levels. Nic nicotine and caffeine, um, these are called central nervous system stimulants, so they may interfere with sleep. So smokers tend to have more difficulty falling asleep and are more easily roused than non-smokers. People who stop smoking often experience temporary sleep disturbances during the withdrawal period. And caffeine blocks those adenosine um, receptors and uh, thereby inhibits sleep. Um, then medications. So many medications can cause sleepiness or excessive grogginess or sedation. So medications that induce sleep um, tend to increase the amount of sleep while decreasing the quality of sleep. Um, Ambien, if you've ever heard that, that promotes normal REM sleep and appears to influence sleep quality less than do other hypnotic medications. Amphetamines, are gonna inhibit sleep because they kind of get you stimulated. Tranquilizers are gonna cause you to reduce the amount of REM sleep, right? Barbiturates are gonna affect that and opiates such as morphine, um, even beta blockers can also decrease your amount of sleep. Illness, so like we talked about at the same time, <coughs> um, illness can cause mental and physical distress which can cause sleep problems, right? Fear of the un, of an unknown outcome with an illness or role changes associated with hospitalization can all cause anxiety, which can decrease sleep and things like that. Then there is um, environmental factors. So the temperature and humidity in the room you're sleeping in, right? The noise and light, it needs to be dark. A bad smell or the comfort of our bedding, all of that's gonna de determine how well or poorly we sleep. So insomnia, this is the inability to fall asleep, remain asleep, or go back to sleep. Okay, so insomnia may be transient or short term, which means it occurs for less than a month, or it can be chronic, which means it occurs more longer than a month, right? So people with insomnia usually report an insufficient quantity and quality of sleep. And they wake without feeling refreshed, even though they are often observed to sleep more than they perceive that they do. Circadian disorders. So this is abnormalities in sleep weight cycles that are caused by things like rapid time zone changes, like jet lag or shift work, like we talked about night shift workers, or a change in the total sleep time from day to day. So symptoms of this are gonna include decreased vigilance, right? Decreased ability to perform certain tasks, short sleep episodes, um, things like that. People suffering jet lag need several days to adjust to their sleep-wake cycle. Restless leg syndrome. So this is a disorder of the central nervous system that's characterized by uncontrollable movement of the legs while resting or before sleep onset. It tends to run in families, um, it affects five to 15% of American children or of Americans. And then children and adults experience this as well, but it's especially common in older adults. Um, and then hypersomnia. So this is people with excessive daytime sleepiness who nap or fall asleep at times and in situations when they need or wish to be awake and alert. So there's the sleep disorders that commonly, commonly cause hypersomnia are obstructive sleep apnea and narcolepsy. So <clears throat> we'll talk about those in the next slide, but hypersomnia may be caused by disorders of the central nervous system, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, so sorry. 
So sleep apnea, this is a periodic interruption in breathing during sleep. So it's an absence of airflow through the nose or the mouth during sleep. Okay. Typically the soft tissue of the pharynx and the small soft palate collapse and obstruct the airway. Episodes may occur several or a hundred times a night and may last for as long as one minute. During periods of apnea, the oxygen level in the blood drops and the carbon dioxide levels go up, right? And that causes the person to wake up. This may result in cardiac dysrhythmias or increases in pulse and blood pressure. Symptoms of sleep apnea include snoring and feeling very tired throughout the day. Then there's narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is a chronic disorder caused by the brain's inability to regulate sleep-wake cycles normally. The distinction between sleep and being awake is blurred. And at various times, the person with narcolepsy experiences a sudden uncontrollable urge to sleep lasting from seconds to minutes, even though the person sleeps well at night. They cannot avoid the sleep ep episodes, but they do awaken easily. Narcolepsy is characterized by sleepiness, slurred speech, slacking of the facial muscles, a feeling of impending weakness of the knees, paralysis, and hallucinations. Performance is impaired during these micro sleep episodes. So sleep episodes can come on suddenly, even while the person's having a conversation. And then there are things called parasomnia. So this is things like sleepwalking or sleep talking, okay? Um, this occurs during stages three and four of NREM sleep, and usually one or two hours after the person falls asleep. So typically the sleeper will leave their bed and walk about with little awareness of their surroundings. They may perform what appear to be conscious motor activities like brush their teeth or make coffee, but the person does not wake up. This person is not aware of sleepwalking and has no memory of the event when they wake up. So the most common intervention and the most important intervention for these patients is safety, safety, safety. You'll especially see this a lot in young children, which they typically grow out of. But we always want to think about safety and their risk for injury. Okay, that's super important when thinking about sleepwalking. Um, bruxism. So this is the grinding and clenching of the teeth, which occurs during stage two of NREM sleep. It can eventually erode tooth enamel and loosen the teeth. And the noise can also disturb the bed partners to sleep. Then there's night terrors. So night terrors are sudden arousals in which the person who is often a child is physically active, often hallucinatory, and expresses a strong emotion such as terror. So typically they will wake up, these children will wake up in the middle of the night, they'll typically cry or scream in fear, they'll thrash around, they will resist all attempts by their parents and caregivers to hold or console them. The child looks like they're fully awake, but they're not. In fact, they're in the middle of, the, of a night terror and they're extremely, extremely hard to awaken. Episodes can last from 10 to 30 minutes. However, the child typically returns to sleep without awakening and in the morning has no memory of the event. And then there's enuresis, which is nighttime incontinence past the stage at which toilet training has been well established. Okay, so it's incorrectly been associated with dreaming. However, most incidents occur during the in REM sleep during the first third of the night when the child's difficult to arouse. So that can be a thing as well. So bedwetting, enuresis bedwetting. <coughs> the nurse is caring for a hospitalized client who normally works the night shift at his job. The client states, I don't know what is wrong with me. I have been napping all day and can't seem to think clearly. The nurse's best response is, A, you are, in a, you are sleep deprived. That will resolve in a few days. B, you're experiencing hypersomnia. So it will be important for you to walk in the hall more often. C, there has been a disruption in your circadian rhythm. What can I do to help you better sleep at night? Or D, I will, notice, I will notify the doctor and ask him to prescribe a hypotonic medication to help you sleep. The correct answer here is C, there has been a disruption in their circadian rhythm, right? So sometimes napping can disrupt that as well as interference with any stages of sleep. And someone who is hospitalized is definitely at risk for interference in the stages of sleep. Okay, um, all of these other choices um, just kind of brush off the problem or give incorrect information. So we're not going to just notify the doctor and get a hypnotic medication to help them sleep without trying other things. Okay, that's kind of invasive to start off with that. 
Um, telling them they're sleep deprived, but that it'll resolve in a few days is just kind of brushing it off, honestly. And then talking about experiencing hypersomnia, that's just not accurate. Here's another. So for which sleep disorder would the nurse most likely need to include safety measures for the client's plan of care? Snoring, enuresis, narcolepsy, or hypersomnia? Narcolepsy. This can occur suddenly during the daytime hours when a person's involved in any type of activity, right? And they can just fall asleep. So going through the nursing process, so we're going to do our assessment. So we're going to talk to our patient about their sleep patterns. How do they normally sleep? When do they best sleep? Do they do shift work? Do they have any other risk factors? What's their sleep rituals? Do they drink a big glass of milk before they go to bed? Do they sleep in a room that doesn't have a TV or any, anything else? Is it completely black? Do they sleep with the TV on? You know, what's, what's their, do they use any sleep aids at home? Do they take Ambien? Do they take NyQuil? And have they noticed any sleep changes or problems um, before this? And then some nursing diagnoses that may be appropriate um, and approved for this situation would be um, readiness for enhanced sleep or disturbed sleep pattern. Okay, so for instance, a patient in the hospital who isn't sleeping well, a good choice would be disturbed sleep pattern, okay, because we often do that um, to our patients. They get very little sleep in the hospital. And then when promoting sleep, so what are our nursing interventions? What are we going to do about it? So we're going to cluster care. This means we're going to do all of our care in one fell swoop so we don't have to go into the room and disturb them multiple times a day. So we're gonna avoid those unnecessary interruptions unless that patient's critically ill. Do not wake them up for morning vital signs if they're sleeping, that kind of thing. We're gonna create a restful environment. So many people find it difficult to sleep in an unfamiliar bed or even in a comfortable one. So hospital beds are not noted for their luxury. So you can help make them more comfortable by making sure they have nice, clean, tight, applied bed linens um, and loose, bed linens on top that allow them to move their legs and their feet. Make sure they have enough pillows, keep their linens clean and dry. Um, make sure that they're in good body alignment, right? Um, keep the room dark and quiet unless the patient prefers a light, right? Um, and then as much as possible, try to control the temperature of the room and provide good ventilation. And again, we wanna promote as much comfort and relaxation as possible. So be sure to offer pain medications at their scheduled time if possible. Um, before their patient's sleep time, if, if they um, are trying to go to sleep, maybe so they don't wake up in pain, right? And then other comfort measures like providing a restful environment, um, offering fluids, cold cloths if they want a, a massage or a back rub. We're going to support any bedtime rituals or routines that they have at home. Um, so for instance, if they watch TV before bed, drink warm milk, pray, meditate. We want to allow them to do these things to prepare for sleep. So like we talked about, um, those are all great interventions. The, the warm milk is a great intervention for sleep. Um, for children, maybe they have a favorite doll or a blanket or a bedtime story, as well as brushing their teeth or hair. Um, try to include those in their routines as well. Um, and it may advise patients who smoke not to smoke after their evening meal. We wanna always maintain the safety of the client, okay? So if we have a patient who we know is at risk for sleepwalking, we wanna make sure that their room is not full of clutter and things that they could trip over. Um, we maybe should provide education to the parents of these, these children who sleepwalk to maybe watch the stairs and make sure that all of the doors are locked in the home. Um, again, offer food that help promote sleep like the, the animal protein and the, um, glass of warm milk, teach about sleep hygiene, um, and then administer complete teaching about sleep-inducing medications. And again, we don't use those unless they're absolutely necessary. And that concludes this lecture.